Good afternoon. I am delighted that my guest today, Dr. Ilian Stefanov, who is head of support and well-being for students at the University of Wolverhampton, has joined me to discuss some very important issues related to mental health well-being and suicide prevention. In our live interview, we were talking about some of the methods that you use at the University of Wolverhampton to reach students and to reach staff, such as mindfulness. And I'm wondering, what are some of the obstacles that you have to overcome to encourage students and staff to use your services? For example, whenever I had a student who was troubled, depressed, anxious, I would recommend they go to the counseling service, but they would be shy. So I would walk them over. I would literally walk them to student services, sit down with them, help them fill out the appointment form if they needed my help. And I felt like they just needed that extra little support to get through that threshold. So what techniques are you using now to overcome the obstacles of reaching students and staff? That's a very, very good question, Joe. And thank you for starting with, uh, with this question. It's probably the biggest issue every student support service has uh, in the UK. On one hand side, we have very highly qualified, experienced professionals uh, able to deliver uh, top quality uh, support to students, mental health and well-being support. On the other hand side, we, we do have students and significant numbers of students with mental health issues who badly need this sort of support. But in between, it's a gap, mm -hmm. exactly uh, the way you explained it. Uh, why is that so? Well, uh, one of the, the symptoms of the, the side that uh, mental health issues have is when people begin to have mental health issues, they withdraw from social life. Uh, they tend to isolate themselves, lock themselves in their own accommodation rooms, and uh, they don't have the urge to go and speak with someone. Uh, on the contrary, they don't have uh, either the energy or uh, the will or the, the strength uh, to do so. So what happens is we do have the support, there is the need for that support, and those two are not connected. So you, are the, you have uh, described how you breach that gap. You simply pick up a student and you come up uh, to the services with them, give them this, uh, this little bit uh, of extra strength uh, to, to do so. And that's fantastic. That's why uh, we do awareness uh, classes uh, with uh, all staff, academics and non-academics as well, uh, making sure they, they can uh, pick up on the science. Because uh, if you do not pick up on the sign, then you miss the opportunity to help someone. So once they, they know how to pick up on signs, then the next thing is how to make their uh, job easy. So not to try to search, where do I go? Who do I speak with? Uh, or just be frightened, oh, what happens now? But to know one place where you can go and uh, make sure that the student will get the support. So uh, we have this one point, uh, one uh, point of contact. It is a physical, and now we live in a digital world as we all see right now. So there also is a digital uh, single point of contact for those sort of services. So this makes it uh, easier. And then uh, what else is uh, necessary? Well, we need to make sure that uh, we monitor the student population. We don't wait for them to come forward or the, the, them to be uh, active. So we need to move from reactive service where we sit and wait for someone to come and use our services to proactive service where we monitor what's happening. And if we spot things that may suggest someone is having uh, mental health issues, we go to them rather than waiting for them. In what way? For example, well, if students begin to miss classes, that's a qu question mark, it's a red flag going up. So it begs the question, why is it so? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there is, uh, every university has to monitor attendance uh, simply because of uh, visa regulations for uh, visa nationals, but we monitor for all students. So this information is sitting there, no one is using it. Mm -hmm. We can use it, so yes. it's, it's beneficial. And well, when we go to a student and drop them an email and or call them and say, well, you've not been attending classes last week, so what's up, um, we're just, uh, we're not, uh, spying on you, we're trying to uh, offer you uh, help and support. In many cases, they come back and say, well, it was my birthday. I just have three nights out and, and so sure. on. So bless you. <laughs> so, 
that's student life, fantastic. Yeah. But sometimes it is not a happy uh, situation. So then we are able to connect. And once we are able to connect, then help is working. What about adults, the staff members? I remember when I was teaching, occasionally a staff member would come to me in crisis. Maybe they were having financial problems or they were having problems with their partner or spouse. And I would refer them to the mental health services offered through human resources at the university. And they would say, I don't want anyone to know. So that's why they were confiding in me. Yeah. How do you bridge that gap with adults? Well, uh, the first part of uh, what works for students work for staff too. So if we raise awareness across the institution, if we deliver uh, self-help resources to all uh, people to use, so uh, th then uh, it's not a problem uh, who knows, no one knows. So if I am beginning to have issues and I know that self-help is available, I can check on the list what's, what's in there and I can choose what's the, what suits me best. Or, uh, well, if it is um, more than that, then there is a second line of uh, support through HR. Uh, and that's why uh, most HR services have confidential uh, counseling service or mental health well-being service. How does it work? Well, it's only a listed number or a link and the staff number needs to, uh, the staff member needs to contact that service. It is an outside service. It's not within that university. Uh, that service do not, they never tell the names of people who contact them. They only build the university as per the number of hours uh, they deliver support. So it's completely confidential. And then uh, trained staff within the university on uh, mental health, well-being, first aid or uh, suicide prevention like you are, I am, and quite a few more. Well, if a staff member comes and confines in me how they feel, because of this little training we've, uh, we've had, we can help them. We can sometimes help them just by speaking with them or just by actually listening to them. People need to be listened to. And that's it. So it's simple. Yes, what great, what great ideas. Speaking of um, issues, the big issue of our time, of course, Ilion, is the global pandemic. And I wonder from your experience, how is this impacting mental health in general? Well, isolation never helps. Uh, so uh, people who are experiencing mental health issues, uh, isolation is something that we try to tackle and uh, propose to them, go and meet with people, uh, speak with your friends, speak with your family, uh, classmates, flatmates, uh, be among people. Now we cannot. Of course we can speak with uh, each other over the internet, but it's not the same experience as being physically uh, in close proximity. So it is um, uh, making things more difficult. It, make, uh, it makes things uh, uh, sometimes uh, very challenging, especially for young people. We do have uh, students living in uh, small spaces in university accommodation who have not left uh, for home but stayed. Mm -hmm. So all the way more, uh, more difficult for them. Uh, it's, uh, it's not making things easier. So it's good that these services, they're then in place to address these issues because they're probably going to intensify as the weeks go on. And as the students return to, uh, to campus, they'll have no issues. You know, when I took your um, suicide prevention workshop, I learned that male suicide is at an all time high in the United Kingdom, that men are three times more likely in the UK to die by suicide, and they're five times more likely to die of that terrible disease in the Republic of Ireland. And in Scotland, the number of suicides has increased by nearly 53% by young people, the children, the young people you work with, 15 to 24 years of age, and it's now the highest it's ever been since 2007. How may you help someone who appears to be seriously distressed and might think of harming themselves. Walk us through the steps of what we should look for and how we can offer help. So first of all, uh, talking about suicide, we're not talking about mental health illness. So thinking about suicide doesn't mean that uh, if I think about uh, killing myself, it's not me being mentally ill. Uh, so that's important to, uh, to start up with. Second thing is, 
uh, we believe that people uh, who are thinking, seriously thinking, killing themselves, taking their own lives, don't want really to die, but they just cannot, don't know how to keep living. So that's the, the big kind of uh, the mm -hmm. for them. So uh, what are the steps? Uh, in the uh, mental health first aid uh, course, there are five steps, like CPR for the physical first aid, uh, for the mental health first aid course, uh, in, in terms of suicide, there are five steps. We call them ALGI, and uh, each um, letter, it's an acronym, uh, it's a, a short for, uh, so A uh, is ASK. ASK means ask about suicide. We often, uh, fear asking uh, about uh, suicide and uh, fear asking with a direct question because if the answer is yes i do think uh, i am planning uh, taking my own life it it freaks you out it's 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 horrible it's it's uh, unthinkable but actually asking a direct question gives you a chance to understand what really happens mm -hmm. because you can walk in the park and see somebody sobbing on a bench there and it may be something completely different but just checking with them it helps uh, it it tells the person i care mm -hmm. so it's not something the people will say it's my privacy why why did you ask so that's asking about suicide and make sure that we understand the answer and if the answer is ambiguous ask again and ask in a straight way so uh, for example uh, have you been thinking killing yourself rather than you're not thinking killing yourself are you because we all know in british culture what the answer of the second question would be no of course not no. yeah uh, even if they do so a straight uh, worded question have you thought about suicide or something in that sort so next thing is uh, listen when we hear that someone uh, is thinking about killing themselves, planning them, uh, taking their own life. We feel this angst and uh, fear and uh, horrible feeling that, no, don't, that's, you should not do that. And we want to help right there and then, but they are not ready for that. And that's the big thing uh, that this course teaches us on. Uh, it tells us that actually they need to be listened to mm -hmm. rather than listen to us. Mm -hmm. And listen to, what does it mean? Well, we say, I understand. You just told me that you're thinking uh, about ending your own life. Why? What happened? So the second question we ask them is not uh, uh, after the uh, have you thought about suicide, is what happened? And give them time to talk about it. So to take the, the pressure out of themselves. What we need to listen to, however, in that stage is not why they want to kill themselves, but we try to listen for small bits that show why they may wish to live. Mm. They are in such a dark place at that moment, they cannot see those things, but they say them out without even realizing. Mm -hmm. We pick up on that, and the next stage is uh, our G's G, give uh, reassurance and, and information. And give reassurance, uh, it helps them, it tells them, actually, you have something uh, good in your life. It's not all bad. Mm -hmm. It's your tunnel vision at the moment that prevents you from seeing the wider picture, but mm -hmm. we explore something. So uh, why don't you speak with a professional? Mm -hmm. There is this uh, information that's available for you. If it is difficult uh, for you, I'm quite happy to take you to your GP or to a service. So this, this sort of connection. Then uh, the, the next day from... Algae's E. Uh, so you uh, you give them uh, professional. Uh, you connect them with professional uh, help, mm -hmm. and the pro uh, professional help. Well, it's first aid course. We are not meant to treat people. We are not meant to uh, do more than just a quick interaction, connecting them uh, with uh, the professional people. So uh, connecting with professional people will be either within the institution or uh, for national services like uh, NHS. Mm -hmm. And then the last uh, e, the last uh, step is uh, give them, uh, uh, connect them with uh, self-help. Why self-help comes after professional help is, well, it's always better to check 
uh, with a professional before you attempt like CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, on your own or, or something similar. So uh, that's, the, that's the last step and that's, that's how it works. That is fantastic. You know, the interesting thing about the acronym algae is algae, of course, produces chlorophyll and chlorophyll promotes life. So if you simply think of mental health services as the algae that sustains life by giving hope, as you mentioned, when um, after you've asked and you've listened, uh, and as far as being shy about asking, are you thinking about suicide? What I found is with practice, one gets more confident and gets better at asking that question because I know that I was shy about asking a personal question like that. But as you said in our class that you taught, if you don't ask that question, something is left unsaid. And you really need to know if they've been contemplating thinking about suicide. If you had an unlimited budget at the University of Wolverhampton to develop and deliver student services and mental health, what might you do as we grapple with the troubles of the pandemic and the 21st century, what would you do? It's a simple thing, preventative work. Tell me. So if we spent all the money on the world to treat all the illnesses through NHS or through other health services, we will never succeed. Mm -hmm. the, the real possibility to succeed is to prevent it from happening altogether. So at the moment, so the situation is so difficult, so challenging. Uh, we use most of our resources mm -hmm. to help those who need it. So if I had additional resources to that, because it's uh, difficult to, to know that there is a waiting list for people to get help and you withdraw part of the resource to do promotion of good well-being, then more people are waiting. So that's, that's a challenging um, situation for every manager. But if more resources are available, uh, I think uh, they should be directed towards prevention, prevention. towards uh, promoting uh, positive mental well-being. And through that road, we will decrease the number of people beginning to need mental health and well-being support. And that should be the goal. As you mentioned in the live program, the University of Wolverhampton is about to pioneer in creating a bespoke module in mental health well-being, which I hope other universities will follow your great lead. And speaking of following your great lead, I want to thank you for leading me and hundreds of other faculty and staff in the United Kingdom and far beyond to better tools to help our students and to help our family and friends to practice good mental health through, as you mentioned, prevention. We are a much better society for having men like Dr. Ilyan Stefanov. And I thank you so much for joining us for the Edinburgh Interfaith Association Spotlight on Mental Health today. Thank you, Ilyan. Thank you, Joe. God Cheers. bless. Thank you.